This is a true story. Imagine that each criminal case carries its own mystery. Could these seemingly isolated crimes be sinisterly interconnected? Today, we will uncover the beginnings of a chain of deaths that plagued Virginia in the United States for three years. Behind these crimes lies one of the most notorious and enigmatic homicide stories in the state. With every new detail we reveal, a question emerges. What is the true extent of this web of death? The story begins in 1981 with Kathleen Thomas, one of the few women to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy in Massachusetts. For five years, Kathleen excelled, reaching the rank of lieutenant and later commanding an important post in the Navy in Virginia. In 1986, after being discharged, Kathleen moved to Virginia Beach, becoming a successful real estate broker and starting a master's degree in business administration at Old Dominion University. Rebecca Dowski, on the other hand, came from Paris and in 1986 arrived in Virginia to seek new opportunities. At William & Mary University, Rebecca dedicated herself to her studies and worked at a daycare. Her life changed when she met Kathleen at an event where a friendship quickly evolved into something more. On October 9, 1986, Kathleen and Rebecca were last seen in a computer lab at William & Mary University. Rebecca planned to visit friends in Pennsylvania and then go to New York, where her family lived. Kathleen intended to stay home over the weekend. Concern arose when both disappeared in the following days. Initially, friends and colleagues thought they might have changed their plans, but concern grew by Sunday when a 1980 white Honda Civic was found under strange circumstances near Colonial Park in Williamsburg. A pedestrian seeing the poorly parked car in the bushes called the police, suspecting a drunk driver. But before we continue to receive more videos like this, subscribe and hit the bell because YouTube often does not recommend videos like this as they consider them violent. Upon investigating the abandoned car, park rangers found a shocking scene. Two female bodies, one in the back seat and another in the trunk. The FBI, arriving first due to federal jurisdiction, noted failed attempts to burn the bodies with D Diesel, a less flammable substance than gasoline. Matches and cigarettes were also found, indicating efforts to start a fire. It seemed the criminal attempted to hide the vehicle among the bushes, perhaps intending to push it into the river, but had failed. The victim's purses were intact in the car, lessening the possibility of a robbery. About 150 fingerprint fragments were collected on the vehicle by the FBI, but there were no matches in the records of known criminals. The absence of blood in the car suggested the crime occurred elsewhere, a theory reinforced by the autopsy, which showed that Rebecca Dowski and Kathleen Thomas suffered burns from nylon rope, deep cuts to their throats, and signs of strangulation, indicating strangulation followed by mutilation. The medical examiner confirmed there was no sexual violence, dismissing this as a motive. Signs of struggle from Kathleen, like a cut on her thumb and a strand of hair in her hand, suggested she tried to defend herself against a physically strong attacker, despite her military training and self-defense. Kathleen's ex-boyfriend was considered a suspect, but did not seem to have the strength to confront two women simultaneously. As days passed, the lack of progress in the investigation fueled rumors about the possible existence of two killers, increasing the anguish of the families and the speculative press coverage on the tragic fate of the young women. A year later, attention turned to David Nobling and Robin Edwards, whose tumultuous lives led them to a fateful meeting in September 1987. David, known for his rebellious teen years, was preparing to become a father while Robin, a 14-year-old girl struggled with depression and dreamed of a better future. The night they met at an arcade, after discovering a comedy show was sold out, marked the beginning of a surprising connection between them. Early the next morning, police officer Joey Willard, patrolling near the James River Bridge, noticed David's Ford Ranger parked suspiciously at a popular spot among couples. With the engine running and the doors open, Joey investigated and found underwear and shoes scattered, indicating something serious had happened to David and Robin. Immediately, searches began, focusing on the Ragged Island Reserve, but to no avail. Concern increased after David's father mentioned that his son would never voluntarily leave his truck. The situation worsened when, 
On the second day of the search, a local runner found Robin's body near the James River with signs of violence on her neck and David's body just 30 meters downstream, also showing signs of violence. The sinister details came to light after autopsies indicated that both were killed with shots to the head. David had an additional wound on his shoulder, suggesting an attempt to escape before being hit. The investigation was complicated by frequent hunting activity in the area, despite .22 caliber cartridges found near the bodies. The investigation initially considered a robbery, especially since Robin's wallet had disappeared, but it was also considered possible that it had been carried away by water. Rumors that David had been threatened by a local family led to intense questioning of these suspects by Sheriff Dixon, who eventually dismissed them. The complexity of the crime scene sparked debates about which department should lead the investigation, resulting in a task force between state and municipal police, and a $5,000 reward was offered for information. While there were persons of interest, the evidence was predominantly circumstantial. The press compared this case to the double homicide of Kathleen Thomas and Rebecca Dolsky, noting similarities, although initially, investigators were skeptical about a connection between the cases. Over time, the possibility that the murders did not occur where the bodies were found added more mystery to the case, further complicating the investigations. In April 1988, a disturbing case again stirred the community when Richard Call, 20 years old, and Cassandra Haley, 18, disappeared after a party. They planned to return before 2 a.m., but were never seen again. The next morning, Cassandra's disappearance was reported, and Richard's car was found near Colonial Park with personal items and no signs of a struggle. The discovery of the vehicle raised more questions than answers, increasing the urgency and pressure on already tense investigations into the violent crimes in the region. Hours after the car was found, a park ranger noticed that the driver's door was ajar and the glove compartment open, with personal items disarrayed. These changes suggested possible tampering with the scene. The FBI took over the investigation, noting that the vehicle appeared to have been moved and mud on the tires and the adjusted seat position indicated that Cassandra might have driven last. An extensive search with tracking dogs along the Colonial Park shoreline was conducted, but the couple was not found. Family members and the local community rejected the idea that Richard and Cassandra might have voluntarily gone swimming on a cold night. FBI agent Joe Wolfinger speculated that the car's location might be a distraction from the actual location where the bodies were, possibly carried by the river's current. Over time, fears grew that the bodies would never be found. While families and authorities intensely debated the mysterious circumstances surrounding the case, Family suspected that park rangers had found the car much earlier than officially reported and had not handled the situation properly. They believed the rangers had removed and replaced items in the car in an attempt to identify the owner, a claim denied by the authorities. Despite the controversies and lack of concrete evidence, the case was closed, but not before being linked to four other mysterious murders in the area. Amid these events, the FBI offered a $10,000 reward for information about the murders of Kathleen Thomas and Rebecca Dalsky. This led to the emergence of Ron Little, a New Zealander working as a private investigator and whose mother employed Robin Edwards. Ron sent confusing letters to the media and politicians claiming persecution by the FBI and linking his investigation to two other cases unknown to the agency. The FBI discredited his claims, and after discovering convictions that prohibited him from remaining in the U.S., they deported him. In 1989, another mystery arose when Daniel Lauer and Anna Maria Phelps disappeared while traveling on Interstate 64 to Virginia Beach. They were last seen on the night of September 5th, and the next morning, only Daniel's Chevy Nova was found abandoned. The search for them ended tragically when their bodies were found under a blanket on a secluded road off Interstate 65. Decomposition and signs of animal activity prevented an exact determination of the cause of death. Although it was clear that Anna Maria had a defensive injury and Daniel possibly faced a similar fate, both had their wallets stolen, suggesting robbery as a motivation for the crime. If you are enjoying the video, please leave a like so I know to continue this project the bodies of Daniel Lauer and Anna Maria Phelps were sent to the Smithsonian for detailed examinations, revealing that Anna Maria suffered knife wounds, 
This grim detail, along with the loss of a large sum of money that Daniel's father had given for a new start, strengthened the theory that the crime was motivated by robbery. Intense coverage of the case by programs like Unsolved Mysteries and other media began to link these murders to others in the region, suggesting the actions of a possible serial killer. Although authorities were hesitant to officially endorse this theory, they did not dismiss the possibility of a connection between the Deaths, considering the geographical proximity and similar circumstances. These tragic events, known as the National Park Pathway Murders, show an alarming pattern where victims typically young and in isolated locations were attacked. The hypothesis is that the perpetrator may have disguised themselves as an authority figure to approach the victims, increasing local fear and confusion and challenging authorities to unravel a mystery that has lasted over three decades. Discussions about patterns and crimes indicated that these murders occurred on long weekends, with September and October being critical months. Variations in execution methods, which include shootings, strangulations, and stabbings, suggested that the killer may have altered their approach to confuse authorities, a behavior reminiscent of the infamous Zodiac Killer. State police behavioral science expert Larry McCann and the FBI initially agreed that the crimes pointed to a single author. However, in a twist in 1990, McCann McCann suggested the existence of a second killer, later revealing that this was a strategy to extract information from a potential accomplice. He eventually confessed to believing that the killer had died, as the sequence of crimes had ceased. The investigation gained new momentum by revisiting events from 1984, where Michael Margaret and Donna Lynn Hall disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Their jeep was found with traces of blood and their bodies were hidden under a blanket with indications of alcohol and drug use. More detailed examinations revealed that both were drugged with Demerol and brutally murdered, with a third type of blood found at the scene, adding complexity to the case. These findings broadened the scope of the investigation and suggested that the pattern of homicides may have started much earlier than initially documented, raising anguishing questions about how many other victims may have been silenced by the same killer before this series of events was discovered. The brutality and complexity of the murders of Michael Margaret and Donna Lynn Hall suggested an extremely meticulous and organized criminal who drugged his victims before murdering them. This modus operandi may have evolved, culminating in equally horrific crimes, but with variations in executions. One of the most notorious cases linked to this possible serial killer is the murder of Lolly Winans and Juliana Williams in 1996. The two, camping in Shenandoah National Park, were found dead under horrific conditions, with no signs of robbery or sexual violence, suggesting a crime motivated by hatred. The story gained a new chapter in 2009, when Fred Atwell, a former police officer with a criminal record, alerted about the online circulation of sensitive photos of the crimes. This reignited the investigations and speculations, especially about the possibility of a police officer being involved in the murders, a theory that gained strength when the FBI began considering Atwell as a person of interest. Fred Atwell, initially seen as a helpful informant, was eventually discredited after being arrested for robbery, revealing himself as an exploitative figure. His involvement raised questions about the integrity of the investigations and prompted the FBI to revisit the case. Steve Spingola, a retired investigator and host of the Cold Justice program, brought new perspectives to the old cases, speculating that multiple criminals with distinct motivations might be involved. He considered the possibility of a connection between hate crimes and unsuccessful robberies and raised the hypothesis that a note found with Anna Maria Phelps could indicate a meeting with a lover that ended tragically. In 2024, DNA analysis identified local fisherman Alan Wilmer as a suspect in the murders of David Nobling, Robin Edwards, and Teresa Lynn Spall Howell, with the latter's death showing signs of sexual violence. This breakthrough not only clarified old cases but also highlighted advances in DNA technology. Despite the different methods used in the crimes, the persistent efforts of investigative teams show the profound impact of these tragedies on communities and law enforcement.
Wilmer's death in 2017 prevented any possibility of questioning him about the crimes he allegedly committed. Known in the community only as a fisherman with hunting hobbies and an interest in firearms with no criminal record, the revelation of his DNA linked to multiple murders surprised everyone, painting the picture of someone who hid their true predatory nature under a facade of normalcy. The discovery of Alan Wilmer's DNA at the crime scenes only occurred after his death, raising questions about the reasons authorities collected and analyzed his genetic material posthumously. With this revelation, the FBI now seeks anyone who interacted with Wilmer, whether in hunting, work, or fishing, to determine if he may be involved in other unsolved homicides. This call for witnesses aims to compile a more detailed profile of his activities and his associations, hoping to clarify the extent of his crimes and whether other cases may be connected to him. Although the identification of Wilmer as a suspect brings some closure, the complexity and gravity of the crime still leave many uncertainties and sadness. The families of the victims and the community continue with numerous questions, and investigators continue working to fully unravel the mysteries surrounding this series of tragic events. Subscribe to the channel to not miss when a new video comes out in this format, and be cautious with the people around you. I hope to see you in a next video.